Yeah. Uh, we'll call the meeting to order. I need a motion to accept the minutes on uh, February 21st. We'll move by Dave O'Brien, second by Dave Skelly. Any questions on that? All in favor say aye. Aye. Right. Well, Those carrying. Okay, first up is on Waters annual report. No, no, that's you. Oh, there he is. Okay, Brian. Oh, perfect. I did my job. Davis reading. Right. So um, I'm not going to read through the whole thing. Um, I'll just read a little bit. End of the report. Um, if you have any questions, please feel to reach out to me at the district. But I just wanted to um, say that we deeply appreciate continuing support of Washington County Board of Supervisors, not only financially, but through the resolution to keep district law the same at the local level and keep the makeup of the district board the same. We will look to continue being an asset to the county and its landowners. I want to reiterate that we continue to do our best to provide assistance to any and all landowners that call, email, or walk through our door. Our priority is resolving resource concerns in regards to soil and water. Sometimes there are no quick or easy answers or immediate funding sources available, but we do our best. We also work to maintain and support our existing partnerships with watershed organizations, DEC, Corporate Extension, Conservation District Employees Association, and the State Committee, as well as looking to create new beneficial partnerships that help us increase our expertise and assistance. These active partnerships help to provide funding, technical assistance, and planning for projects both large and small across the district. This being said, we are starting on a path to strategic planning so that we would we may continue to build our capacity and strengthen our mission and vision to best serve the residents of the county. Um, it says up here that the uh, purchase of Bryan storage tank for the town of Salem Hartford. Are all towns eligible to get involved in that? Um, when we had the funding to do that, it was more for the Lake Champlain watershed. Okay. Um, Salem's in the Lake Champlain watershed? <laughs> 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 they called and we asked and they did the paperwork and we paid for that out of district funds. So the only one that, that really approached us from Lake Champlain was Hartford. Um, we asked that they provide us with the documentation and invoices and we would work on it to do some reimbursement. We bought just the tank, not the pumps and whatnot. Um, that's something that's available to all the towns. It just so I mean, is, you gotta, is something still available if we wanted to pursue it this coming year? I wasn't aware of it, so that's why I'm asking. So, We're running <coughs> out, and geez, claim you'd be better to own it. Well, have your town highway supervisor contact us, and okay, we'll see what we can do. Thank you. <coughs> Two things. Number one, uh, I was kind of impressed with the farm safety training. Doing. That's, a, that's a good thing. Wanted to kudo on that. Could you elaborate for me just a little bit on the, what you did over the Georgie invasive species? So, um, was, that, was that in the stream or is that on the ground? No, that's more like terrestrial stuff. Okay. Um, we identified a lot of the invasive species that are there. Um, we're hoping to kind of start working actively on doing some. Uh, bittersweet vines are rampant mm -hmm. um, everywhere. Um, there's some Japanese knotweed, but not terrible. So we kind of want to stay ahead of that. Um, That's something a student group or Boy Scouts or something can help with? It could be. Um, I was recently approached by uh, the coordinator for the BOCES. Um, it's just two hour <coughs> time slots are a little difficult. We'd have to make a good match um, with the right student in the right area so we could actually like meet them there and do work for two hours instead of coming to the office and travel for 20 minutes. I just had the reason I brought it up is that a question come in to me from a Boy Scout group that were looking for outdoor projects like that to get involved in so yep. you wouldn't be mad if I sent them to you. Nope. Okay. Nope. We just we don't have like 
the contact info right. for folks. On that on that specific project, did you work with Back Hill Conservancy? Um, no, we're kind of working on that on our own. Um, we talked with Back Hill Conservancy; they're one of kind of our watershed partners okay. that we do stuff with. Yeah, I just think you get you people get volunteers from them, you know, for for any yep. sort of projects. Yep. Yeah. Right. You know, you had us do a letter of support for not changing the district or whatever. How was that? Where are we at on that? So, as far as I know, there's about 20 counties that have passed resolutions in support of not changing district law at the local or state level um, and all the related facets. Um, I believe the county association. State County is oh, so yeah, has I believe it was on their agenda. I'm not sure where the progress is on that. Okay. Um, so we don't as of last there. week, it was on the agenda for that organization. Yeah, you, and I think that Farm Bureau has gotten behind keeping it the same, but also some of the original organizations that were kind of going with it have re-looked at it and they're back and away from it too. Good. Yeah. Good. The, the group the that was behind it is not like having open active meetings anymore, but I, I'm quite sure that they are still actively pursuing it. Um, I'm sure we'll hear more. And the Class C stream bill is still active. It keeps coming back. Any other questions? The next step? Oh, no, it's going to be up. I'm worried we were. Yeah, I don't think it'll be until the end. It took long enough for us to get some snow, though. Huh? <laughs> yes, I think this has been awful. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dave Perkins, uh, representing the County Snowmobile Association. Uh, each year, clubs have to look at their trail system and figure there's going to be changes from the current year into the new year, which we're already in, actually. Uh, if they are, they've got to get approval from parks, what they call the phase one program. I described some detail for it in a, in a document that I had uh, hopefully was distributed to you earlier today. Um, the, the gist of it all is that the what those changes are. Uh, the barnstormers in Kingsbury have two trails that had to reroute due to farming operations. Uh, Salem um, uh, snow drifters have five trails or each of their trails that has minor reroutes in them, uh, which we you know uh, don't anticipate a problem. The the uh, larger one is the Northern Washington County Trailblazers in Putnam and Dresden have uh, a five mile section of flood trail that they've maintained for years that they now want to apply to parks with funding so they can just assist in the cost of maintaining it. So actually it's going to look for the parks as if it's a new trail. So these uh, these items from these three clubs would become part, would need approval. Parks requires a seeker declaration from the lead agency, which is the county. Um, this isn't new. We've been, been, we've been doing this for a number of years. Uh, Roger handles the paperwork with information that I give him. And uh, at the county generally, it's a negative declaration because the impacts are minimal. Um, so that's really where we're at is need a motion from the, this committee to um, uh, to the Board of Supervisors to have this uh, declaration drawn up and made. So moved by Brian, second by um, Mr. Shaw. All right. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? <coughs> Does have a question? Does have a Maybe either one of the days would know. The, the Champlain Express, when that comes through the, the line, mm -hmm. I don't know if that affects any of these. And I didn't know if they had the information on that. I didn't know if they were going to be running through the winter time once they get going with some of their operation, drilling wise, or if it was going to. I just didn't know if it affected any of the trails. And I didn't know if they that, were that's, that's a good question. And, and I hadn't really considered that. You know, it's just been coming and coming for sure. so long. All of a sudden, now it seems to be here. Right. Um, the only place I think there'll be a problem is where there's road crossings, like on. Uh, uh, Baldwin Corners Road. Uh, the trail has to cross at a public at a public road. I don't know what they plan on doing there. If they're going to rip the road up and, and bury it, shouldn't I don't know how long a period of time. Those are kinds of things that we've got to find out. I, I'm glad you glad you raised that. So you know, Absolutely. that's the only place I can think of that it would be would be a problem. Well, I know it's coming down 22 into White Hall. 
but it's going to go down the old route four. Mm -hmm. and then it's going to join the tracks. Run, you might run 40 and run the tracks all the way down through. Right. Right. So I do know that in some crossings, I don't know about this one, they're going to be directional drilling underneath. Okay. So they have to disturb a lot of the crossings. Okay. All right. I know there's other places like in Whitehall and Fort Edward uh, where there's utilities at the crossings, so it's not going to be as clean as directional drilling. All right. All right. Okay, that, that's it. Sounds like that there is going to be accommodations there. There were things. Go ahead, Jim. I just wondered if this was updated. I see that there's small change to Salem. I'm not a snowmobiler, but I heard there was a real issue north of Salem and the trails got shut off there by a landowner. Is there, is uh, I believe that in this, and I, I believe that is an issue. And actually, that's a great segue into my last thing. Um, I've been doing this for the clubs since 1985. So for 37 years, you've had to deal with me one form or another to, you know, first the snowmobile program. I'm, I'm leaving the, that position, uh, retiring from it, and uh, my replacement is here. I'd like to introduce Becky Bodkin from the Salem Club. She, uh, she will be taking my place and handling all these issues. Would you like to address that question? Well, at this point, we're still waiting to see if he's going to change his mind and, and get us back with us. I sent him a check to pay for the, the camera. Um, it's in his court where if if he still digs his heels in and says no, then we're gonna have to do a work around um, that section. Otherwise we can't get up um, towards Granville from there or forward Vermont. So it's in the works. Apparently a snowmobile stole a trail cam. Yeah, they stole his you know. Yeah, trail camera. Yeah, they've gotten pictures. Of, it was a girl. Yeah, well, the girl of. was the last picture we posted on Facebook. Yeah. The last one they had cameras before they took the SIM card out. So they apparently knew what they were doing. Yeah, um, I'd say she opened a can of worms because according to Facebook, there's a lot of people looking for her. So. Yeah, there are. Yeah, they Very are distinctive sled and jacket and helmet. So hopefully she's either staying away from us or she gets found. Yeah. Um, and uh, she works, she's met uh, uh, Sue Clayman in the administrator's office who handles a lot of their snowmobile paperwork. And, uh, you know, I expect that's going to work well. Becky's worked with Heather with the GIS stuff for a, for a long time. So uh, I, I think it'll be a very smooth transition. But just so you know, um, I'm no longer going to be here. <laughs> but thank you for all your help. It wasn't some busy thing like that. Oh, I'm sure. I, I've seen the exciting agendas. I know. <laughs> I had a real quick question in regards sure. to, so um, I've seen some posts by some of my friends in regards to people, you know, driving across the dirty bridge, you know, right. um, is that a, a, a bigger issue this year or is it you know, about the same as it's been in the years past or? It, it just, it depends on the area. Um, there was such limited snow that, you know, you, you get you get one storm and they op try opening the trails and people are, from the first snowstorm we got, we were able to actually open, people stayed on the trails, but the last one, it's like they were going all over the place. And if, if there's a problem like that, the landowner really needs to get a hold of the local yeah. club and see if there's a, an access point that can be blacked off. We, we put a lot of gates up in yeah. Kingsbury to keep people on the trail and away from where they are supposed to go. Gates and fences. We're always putting up fences, but they'll drive through. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we can't fix stupid. <laughs> you haven't been on the county long enough. Common sense is in a flower that blooms around here. So. <laughs> hey, thanks for your work. Dude. Well, thank you, Rocky. Appreciate all the help that, did, that you folks have given the, the clubs here in Washington County. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Right, thank you. You'll see that secret form before you vote on the, uh, the board declaration and things for the board. So, your resolution will say you're right. So, <laughs> thank you. 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 The fewer years in the morning, it's just going to talk specifically that we're uh, sort of left wide open. Uh, the first of all is that there was no risk deals to schedule more budgeting, but we have to get information to the, uh, to, the, to the counties 
before we actually saw what we're going to get in revenue because CFA grants came out. We kind of lot on CFA pay grants for our, our revenue. Um, so it's more standardizing that, putting it in there. Um, there was also the formula that uh, we put together based on each county's contribution. Uh, that was a little bit uh, misleading about when it should be recalculated. I think it should be recalculated every year because it's based on caps population and assessment of each county. So we wanted to standardize that. Um, but there's nothing radically different in here. It's just standardizing what was there. So that we have moved the request the our, our budgetary process to the regional planning board being able to have information supplied for counties in September and we can pass our actual yeah. The other the other big change was working with the budget officers because we had five counties with five different budget expectations. Mm -hmm. So now that Doc just says whatever that county's procedure is, we will comply to that procedure. That because we had five different budget officers that wanted five different things. So now it just says we'll do what they need to do their job. So that was the other language that translated to Doc Cruz. Motion. Yes. Right. Motion. I'll make one. Motion by David. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. And all the MOs are the same for all the counties. Yes, yes. And Roger's going to review this to make sure that we're okay with this. Does it go beyond this committee or we do it right here and that's all? Roger, you the board. Roger, yeah. you review between the between now and the board meeting. I have none of those changes with me. So. Okay. Any other uh, questions, comments, or concerns? We will be contingent upon the other. Other comments? Yeah. All yeah. Comments yeah. 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 Hamilton has already. All in favor say saying aye. 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 Opposed? So, in the agenda that was mailed to everybody was a copy of what the small business team. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah, right. So, anybody who did not see it, um, I have it here. We talked about this at the. Um, uh, at the meeting last month, um, um, which essentially, if you will recall, um, through the through the federal ARPA tribal program, I'm not sure exactly what we're calling it. We found that we were eligible for $100,000 in federal funding. That was it was somewhat part of the ARPA funding. And so we brought that to committee, asked for permission to apply for it. Mr. Millette kindly did so. And within a few days, we had the first, um, the first $50,000. So at committee last month, the discussion on how to expend that money, um, it was decided to split it between funding this program that's going to be managed by the Regional Planning Board and the purchase of an electronic sign for the county. So what we wanted to do today before we finalize that is this uh, document that we wrote up is a, is a brief description of what the program will do. It is intended to get access to technical support for small businesses, which could either be existing businesses in the county or startups. It might mean that um, they need some help with marketing. They need some help with trying to figure out how to scale up on, on, on um, you know, making more product, how to look at new markets. It's very, it was essentially modeled on what we do with HVADC, but HVADC is limited to small agricultural businesses. So this was a way to get similar help to other kinds of businesses in the county. So the decision was to um, set aside half of the funding for this program and half of the funding for the electronic sign. However, we get that hundred thousand dollars in over two year period. We have the first fifty now, and the second fifty um, comes next year. So my ask is going to be that we recognize in my budget twenty five thousand of that, so that I can get invoiced by the regional planning board for this program, and then twenty five thousand of it would go to 
County admin. County admin budget. Um, <laughs> and then when the second 50,000 comes in next year, then again, the, the funding would be split. So that's the ask. But the first thing is, does anybody have any questions about the technical assistance program and how it would work? And I will defer those to Beth. Go ahead, Brad. So is this a, a one year program or is how spread out is this? Maybe two year program. At least. And it, this will start in January of this next year, in the middle of this year? When it it's fine to start the middle of this year. And then go 24 months. Yeah. And Beth, how do you allocate it for businesses? I mean, is it so much per business? Yeah, up to 5000 per business 5, in technical assistance. And we're going to, so we're going to procure um, an array of consultants who specialize in different things, financial literacy, succession planning, you know, business planning. And whatever that business's need is, up to 5,000 of the use of that technical assistance provider to help them. Do they come to you or do you try to reach them? Well, we'll do both. Um, we're going to put together like a um, just kind of an online application. It's going to be first come, first serve, but there are certain criteria they're going to have to meet um, to be able to get that. We are definitely looking towards people who are either starting up and have equity or have secured financing or are in like the process of securing financing either through us or the LDC or a traditional um, no, I thought is a, shouldn't we outreach and target the LDC people yes. yeah. right off the bat as the yeah. first group because yes. our students <laughs> No, no, no. Just and, the and this is just Washington County businesses in this. So you'll see in the last paragraph, it's a piece of a much larger program. So we've gotten 150,000 from Warren County, 50,000 from Washington. We applied for 99,000 from USDA. We applied for $300,000 through our senators and um, congressional direct spending. So it's, you know, we're trying to like build this program, but this will be accounted for separately as, you know, Washington County. Any other questions? Well, basically, a dozen is about what you're going to help you. Yep. Go ahead. Is it, I mean, the funding goes away. Are you looking to train mechanism to build if you want to try to keep the program? Yeah, we're going to try to leverage it into um, an EDA funded program, but we have to build it first and then show it successful. And once you do that, right, then the, the federal coffers open up and we can get sustainable funding source for it. Motion of finance. And motion of finance. Amended by. Yeah. Right. Over there, turn the dam. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Both. So, so let me just clarify are we amending the budget to move it into both? County admin and um, 25 and 25 I each? Yeah. 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 Right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the, <laughs> <laughs> it goes to finance, we do it there, right? Right. right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I don't have much information now. Yeah, I have a um, scheduled appointment with them next week, at the end of next week. Okay. So we'll be able to see what's available. Try to get an idea on the cost because I don't even know what it's going to cost. So you get one side this year and the other side? I know. <laughs> I'll take what I can get. Just a little Bob's picture on one side and Sam's on the other. Yeah. So it's part of which direction you're coming from. Right, glad you're up here. Robin. <laughs> yeah, everybody's favorite song. Um, so you will be glad to know we are we are actually seeing the light at the end of the tunnel here. Um, since I know since <laughs> we put together all of the various and sundry data sources and created the the GIS tool to be able to review basically each parcel across the county. I can tell you. Um, I alone have probably put in 150 hours worth of work since the end of January to, to try and do this because they're just, there was not an easy way to do it. The data sources do not all agree. Um, it basically becomes a matter of reviewing information parcel by parcel to try and determine what the, what 
what is really served and what really isn't served. And I'm going to give you the caveat right now that while I think we are very, very close, it's not going to be 100% accurate. There will be mistakes, um, which as we start negotiating back and forth with providers, hopefully we catch some or hopefully at some point we will um, find a way to reach out once, once any programs we're able to deploy are finished to try and reach out and find a way to see those who uh, we've missed. So to give you a summary of where we are, um, we have unserved, which means absolutely zero access to any kind of, of broadband at all, um, meaning at, at you know, broadband internet speeds. Um, we have about 900 residences. In addition to that, we have about 800 residents who have access only to fixed wireless. It's a little bit harder to, um, I ended up having to separate them because while on a mapping program, you can look at where infrastructure is and determine who has access to a fiber or cable-based solution, the fact that a fixed wireless service can cover somebody doesn't tell me whether there's already an account there or not. And the issue there is that the equipment costs on fixed wireless are fairly expensive. I think it's like five, six hundred dollars, something like that. So if we are looking to help unserved residents get some sort of access to service, what we are going to try and construct is a way to get those 900 people who, who have access to nothing, including fixed wireless, that's going to become a fiber-based solution. But I also think because it would be less expensive for us to subsidize, we can then design a program to do outreach to those who can be served by fixed wireless to help support them in the purchase of equipment. What I do not know yet, again, out of those 800 or so people, how many of them already have service? Many of them might have have a basically have a cost barrier to having service, even though they know that it's there, because the broadband for all rules were um, you couldn't have a cost to I think it was more than forty nine dollars to connect to the service. So a forty nine dollar charge is very different than several hundred dollars to buy equipment. So so the design of how we're going to help people is going to be split between what we can do with fixed wireless and what we're gonna to have to do with fiber. So the next step is going to be, these unserved addresses are all being mapped. We're going to draw the, uh, basically the county into sections and ask the providers to bid, i.e. give us a cost on what it's going to take to get service to every identified address in those sections. Because what I do not wanna do is to continue to perpetuate the Swiss cheese problem, which is like, you know, leave two or three unserved because it's only going to be that much more difficult to get to them. Where are you going? What is a fixed wireless example? Hudson Valley Wireless. Right. So we could um, determine that we would want to give people a choice of Hudson Valley Wireless or Starlink. What I don't have the ability to do with the data that I have is identify what Starlink could or couldn't serve. I will also say that FCC is moving away from considering Starlink to be able to deliver at broadband-based speeds. They're pretty close, but there's been, um, I guess, some degradation of service and they can't uh, uh, move it. So I should say, federal speeds, I don't believe that it's actually been voted on yet, but right now it looks like speeds are gonna be moving to 100 download by 20 megabits upload. Ultimately, it's going to move to 100 by 100. Right now, Hudson Valley Wireless, which is the provider that we have in the county offering fixed wireless, can offer speeds at 100 by 20, which meet the federal threshold. At some point, if the federal government changes those standards to 100 by 100, I, you know, I, I don't know what that's going to mean for the future, but my concern is getting people who do not have access to internet access now, or as soon as we can get them access. So just to clarify, there's 1,700 total residences we're trying to cover? 
about, again, out of those 700 or so, some of that are, have fixed wireless, some of those may already have service. That's well, you, have, you have 900 that are totally unserved. Is that? I have 900 that are totally unserved. They cannot, Hudson Valley Wireless cannot serve them. And there is no fiber. And there's 800 others that are fixed wireless. That are fixed wireless. Some of those may already have service. So I'm, that number is basically going to go down once we get to the final, how many we need to help. But that's that's the fixed number that I'm starting and How many total residents is doing that? So that was my next thing. So to percent served, we have 24,000 households in the county and about 4,500 that are considered by census to be vacant. So if you use that statistic, 96% of our residents right now have access to fiber or coaxial based service. If you then factor in access to the fixed wireless, then that means we have 1,600-ish who don't have access, which brings that number down to 93%, which to my mind is not good enough. We need to approach that 99% served. Um, again, with the funding that we have set aside, the Obviously, the cost to deploy fiber is significantly higher than it would be to offset the cost of some equipment purchases. Um, the other thing I want to mention is so that if that number is calculated based on an inclusion of about 4,500 vacant parcels, it's I'm estimating that out of those 4,500 parcels, about 2,300 of those are actually seasonal residents. So over time, it would be nice to have a solution to ultimately offer seasonal residents. But right now, I think the priority has to be getting access to service to full-time residents. Your 4,500 that are vacant aren't necessarily not served either. The some line of them, might be right some there of the, is vacant. Some of the vacant could be it could be derelict abandoned homes. It could actually be a vacant lot with improvements, which could be a seasonal campsite for somebody. Um, some of them might be, it was misclassified from an agricultural field with a barn to it's just got some sort of a building or some other sort of improvement. So it depends on how you look at the property class code, but about 2,300 of those, what the census calls vacant, 4,500 would be um, seasonal. Sounds awful high. 4,500 out of 24,000, sounds awful high. Well, census, I, I, and, and I'm not going to go into my lecture on how much I trust census data, but census data is what we have. Census says that we have 29,000 households, of which 4,500 are vacant. And I agree, I, I think that's a high number. I think the communication that if you have seasonal residents, seasonal residents are also supposed to submit to the census. Yes, well, see, so, so so census, as in um, Occupy, is your primary residence. It's not seasonal residence. Is not it, it's your primary residence that Correct. you fill out. Correct. Right? You're also supposed to be, have a seasonal home. Right. You're supposed to submit also to the census. Right, but not indicate that that's your primary residence. So Correct. again, I, I I I take that with a grain of salt. I agree. I think that's a high number, um, which is why I actually had our property class codes pulled to see if the numbers did vary. And in fact, the number that I gave you came from our property class codes. I think the census number was even um, lower, higher. Yeah. So no matter how bad the numbers look, we're actually better off than what they show. Well, I, I would say, well, on again, the seasonal issue is to me, a secondary concern. The primary concern has to be to get full-time residents, but there at some point may be a way that we can, we can find a way to help them. Um, so right now, the goal is going to be to find a way to get those approximate 1,600. Again, some portion of those may already have signed up with Hudson Valley Wireless. I'm still working with them to try and make that determination. They've agreed to review the data um, and give me some more accurate numbers. Because for budgetary services, our purposes, I want to know how much we might need to set aside and how we're going to um, create a program that will offset the cost of these. So I'm working on the RFP right now. 
um, and working on putting all of these numbers together. But the piece of identifying the extent of the problem is as done as I can get it without going completely right. <laughs> the question is, are the ones that are classified as unserved, how many are uh, have it passing on the road, but they're farther than any corp any company would uh, stretch out their quarter mile from the road, half mile from the road, a mile from the road? How many of those are classified as unserved? So let me, so I've reached out to many of you, and I'll kind of give you some of the details on the numbers by town, especially to those towns that have um, more significant numbers of unserved. Dave, you and I are going to look at that tomorrow so that I can explain how all of this was done and why I'm saying that despite the preponderance of data, it is not possible to get this 100% accurate because there's just too many factors into what the provider said, what the state thinks, what FCC thinks, et cetera. Um, so it, it became, you know, what I've said to everybody, the smell test, which is I look at where the broadband and the fiber and coax infrastructure is where the parcels are, um, what was claimed to state and federal governments, and try and make a determination as to what makes sense. I am, I be there are many instances, Verizon in particular, on the southern end of the county, they significantly overbuilt. I have instances of fiber that Verizon ran that was not made available to residents. Is so, this still an opportunity? That's going to, I think, end up being part of the negotiating process. I, I think a couple of things have happened. Um, since the federal government made it clear that through the BEAD funding program and other competitive funding programs, on a nation nationwide basis, a lot of the providers have stopped trying to independently build out their networks because they're waiting for federal subsidies. They know money is coming. So they're kind of waiting to see how they can get subsidized to build more um, networks. So part of our negotiation is gonna be, this is what we've determined is unserved. I'm expecting that um, the broadband providers will come back and either um, work with us specifically on the addresses we've identified. They may offer to add some other addresses, but as near as possible, if a provider claims to the federal government that they can offer service to a resident, if that, that location came off of the list, if the provider then comes to us and says, well, we're not really serving them and we'd like to add them to our list of how we get subsidies, I'm going to send them straight to the FCC because they told the FCC that they could serve those locations. So I'm expecting that there is going to be a certain amount of that, yes. So the areas where we have the highest numbers, um, Fort Ann wins at 137 total unserved. Um, Argyle comes in at 122, Granville at 126, and Jackson at 100. All of the other towns are significantly less than 100, and we've actually got Dresden, Fort Edward, Greenwich, Hebron, and Putnam at pretty close to zero. So on the addresses where there are a preponderance of fixed wireless, the area, the towns that that most impacts are Argyle, Easton, and Hartford. There's quite a bit of, of fixed wireless services in those areas. That conversation is Jason. Very little, I think, could be covered with this part. Right. So, any questions? So, you've got a big sheet of Swiss cheese, all these little holes that are unserved. Mm -hmm. And you're going to ask the providers, bid on these holes. Mm -hmm. They may say, we're only going to bid on five holes, but we're going to bid on them all. You got to bid on them all? So I'm going to divide the section, the county up into sections. They're going to have to bid on all the holes in the sections. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> and so you, you may get three bidders on one section and no bidders on another. Correct. That could happen. And so it's basically just a matrix that it all comes down to and you figure out how are you what's what's available until you take those bid quote unquote numbers and factor into the kind of money we have to see how we're going to make that work. Correct, because I am anticipating there's there's a very high probability we are not going to have enough money to cover all of these addresses. 
So, no, no problem. What is the probability with the, the state, I think, and the federal government and the subsidies of uh, running all this and they're waiting to see who gets what? Will they be less aggressive until the state bids that out and uh, they get their funding first from that? Yes, I think so. Um, so, first of all, I, I, I'm I, going to take a shot. I don't know how successful I'm going to be at asking New York State BPO if they'll partner with us as we're kind of trying to get ahead of the game here and help support some of this. But they have very strict regulations that they have to follow based on the way the federal funding is being deployed down at the state level. My concern all along has been that is going to be a very time consuming process. So I, you know, I get calls every week. What about these billions in federal dollars that are coming? It's like, they're coming, but there's a mapping process. There's a this process, there's a permitting process. So we are still, I, I think a few years away before seeing the connections from that. So what, if we cannot find a solution and I can't get help from BPO in the interim to getting all of these unserved addresses served, what will happen is it will wait until there is, uh, it's basically, it'll be federal money that's deployed through the state. So until, until the state programs are rolled out, that they'll, they'll, if we don't have the money to serve them all, then that would be the next choice is to wait till there's money from the state. Want to be attractive to the providers? We can say, you take care of that Swiss cheese hole right there. I'll go check money sitting in this account. We can transfer it as soon as that's done. As opposed to waiting months and months and reams of paperwork they get fit off to the state or that. Oh, that's why we're doing this. Right. So that that right. can streamline the process and make it attractive to a lot of them, shouldn't it? It, it? it does a few things. First of all, right now um, mm -hmm. there are linemen shortage across the nation. There are supply shortages. When the federal funding is used to create uh, broadband deployment programs across the nation there's going to be a huge, because everybody's gonna do it at once. So all of those already um, re slim resources are gonna be even further strained because by the time this money issue is sorted out, everybody's gonna be trying to do the same thing at once. So you get a grid, you get the holes in the grids, you're gonna get bids and all those kind of things. We're gonna get all those data back. We got X amount of dollars. How how and who is going to decide how those dollars are allocated for serving the most people in those holes? We're going to create a broadband selection committee. Do you volunteer? You want to be on? <laughs> 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 I didn't even know about the broadband selection committee, and I just got kicked under the table. <laughs> But 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 that was that is that is a good point because right now I, I'm going to try and get all of this data out here, get information back from the providers about what it's going to cost, and if we end up getting put in a position, which I think that we will, that we're not going to be able to do all of it, we will have to have consensus on our part as to what we fund and how we fund it. How so do you see that timetable playing out? Seriously, I'm hoping to get the RFP out within the next couple of weeks. One of the other concerns that I have is I've told you about the USD Reconnect money that we were um, awarded from Congresswoman Stefanik. Um, there are some limitations on that funding that might make it difficult to impossible for us to use to create these connections. So that's part of the other piece of this is, is what it's going to take in working with USDA as to whether it's going to be possible to meet their requirements. The, the biggest impediment is that USDA, if they, let's say that they funded a million dollars to a provider, they're gonna take a first position asset lien on all of the assets of that provider. So just like you, like wanting to go get a mortgage or buy a car, if every asset that you own has a lien taken out on it in first position and you go try and borrow any money, your credit has just been affected. So nationwide, my understanding from USDA is they've had a very difficult time getting um, broadband providers to partner with them because of that, because they're not necessarily willing to sign the liens that USDA wants them to sign. So I'm still working with USDA. There may be ways to get around that um, 
because certainly that million dollars would go a long way towards getting us some new connections. I just don't have all the answers on it yet. purpose of the lien against the provider? I mean, what is USDA know, is back? USDA is providing a grant yes. to, in this case, it's to us, but it's it's securing, it's basically they're they're providing a grant saying if if you do this, which in our case it was make new connections, right. we'll give you a million dollars. Right. The securing of the lien would be for them to guarantee that those new connections actually happened. Okay, so once it was done. The lien would go away. Correct. Okay. So when you look at the connections, the needed connections, does that include businesses or just residents? I included businesses. Now, I know that uh, in, in some areas like Hampton, I think, and I'm going to be updated with you a little bit more, but I think the blend knowledge, we got one section, two and a half miles, that has no connections. And uh, it's a pretty straight line from County of 18. A up to the, up to the I know where it is. I've looked at it a thousand times. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and when we first had that, looked at that it was like $660,000 of stimulus mileage. Um, since then, some of the, some of the taxes and the tariffs have come down. So I don't know what it would be now, but you know, Spectrum actually has a sort of a map out and partial engineering done to do that. So they should give us a good price. That's where I was getting to. Mm -hmm. We're more cost effective with places that are, we have a lot of connections over a short period of distance and trying to move here, 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 here. Um, well, I said that what I want to do is divide the county into sections. I, I don't think that it's a good idea to divide the county into towns because then if a whole bunch of towns get fully served and a whole bunch don't get served, um, that becomes a problem. So I'm going to try and divide it into sections that most match where infrastructure begins and ends so that it's easier for a, a provider to do the most cost effective bid. The other thing that I would really like to do is encourage them to do, um, uh, to partner. Like if, if two providers want to get together and put a single bid on a geographic area, I, I don't, there are other counties in the state that have done this. Several of them managed to get one provider to agree to cover every single connection. I don't think that's going to happen in this case because we have too many providers and too much Swiss cheese. I think it's going to be multiple providers. Go ahead, Matt. No, go ahead, Dan. I'll let you first. first. He gets fun to say. I, he, he so I'm, questioning myself, I'm questioning myself and my, my brethren. Maybe this committee shouldn't have any brethren. We, we have a partisan interest in all those Swiss cheese holes and those sections. And I'm just wondering if you should have a People can look at it with a real country well, mind first. With a well, county mind rather than the Wait a minute, mind. maybe, yeah, I'm, maybe I'm the committee sure. should be Dresden, Fort Edward, Greenwich, Platinum, and Hebron because they're all covered. Yeah. Work with you. So we have no we have no horse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. take care of my holes, I'll take care of your holes. <laughs> no, but I just because otherwise, unless you have parameters and metrics for that committee and how they're gonna decide. Right. Then it becomes a total political situation. Yeah, so, so if you take the ones that are totally covered, well, right, then we're we do it. because I've created a scoring system. She's way out. Then you don't need just a provider. You got anybody on there. There's metrics, right? You didn't get a broad mixture of people on there. Yeah, I was going for January first. The two of them could be non-supervisors. I'm okay with that. I mean, because then I won't have any partisan interest. But until then, I do. I, I, I leave it up to the <laughs> <laughs> You made that sound so good. So you all just confirmed my point. <laughs> yes. I, I leave it up to the committee to decide, but at some point we're we're going to narrow this down to where decisions have to be made. And the question to the committee is, how do we want to do that? Do you want to leave it entirely in my hands? Do you want to create a committee? I'm not really thrilled about it being entirely in my hands. I'd like to have some other input. But... I'm drawing up your target now. Yeah, exactly. Laura, <laughs> 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 there's one you got to make sure it's fucked up. I don't care about all the rest. That way you and I don't have to get any. Yeah, but I've gotten well, more than one of those in other towns. I'm getting emails, those are not messed up. That's what I haven't figured out. <laughs> go ahead, Dan. George Roger. But. No money can go to a person, right? It has to go, it's going to, to, go to the provider. Uh, so how does the provider, now wait a minute, let me wrap this. For if it's wireless, 
then what do you go to the provider and say, I want these, I want enough, um, how much would it cost to be able to provide 50 people with the equipment to go wireless, right? Is what you do? It's not that equipment. simple. And I'll tell well, you why. I'm trying to make it. Right. So I'll, I'll, sure. I'll, I'll tell you why. So what I'm saying right now is that we have about 800 households that have access to fixed wireless. Some of them may or may not already have fixed wireless. Nationwide, the statistics are that when a broadband program rolls out, the take rate the first year is about 40% of people who are offered broadband services actually sign up. And it takes an average of about four years for that to reach 75%. So what I have asked Hudson Valley Wireless to do is to create a marketing program that will outreach to those addresses that have, I have identified as only having access to Hudson Valley Wireless based on the number of people that they say want to sign up, like i.e. I don't want to fund equipment for everybody just because they happen to be eligible. We want to fund equipment to people who are going to take the service and subscribe to internet. So I won't know that until there's a marketing program designed. So, and they've so they'll outreach. provide a number. Yes. And then you'll negotiate a price for that number to buy the equipment. Yes. And similarly, we we I would prefer not to pay 100% of the deployment cost for fiber. So I, you know, I'd, I'd like that to be at a 50-50 level, but that may not be feasible depending on the provider cost. So there's there's going to be some negotiation back and forth as to what, what the cost is going to be that it takes to get these connections made. And you've written it that way? Working on writing it that way. This is all in my head. The money goes to Hudson <laughs> Valley take care of. Correct. So it's not the person. Right, correct. Okay. And it's I for it. the equipment. I got right. it. And yep. Yep. however many you sell. However right. many they decide they're yes. going to yes. sign yes. up, we yes. subsidize the yes. provider. In a larger number, you might get a better price than in the region. So that will all be in your negotiation. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Thank you. Anything else from the guests? I'll go ahead. <laughs> <Poor Al. laughs> so is there, can you probably throw something at me because I know I've asked you this before. Isn't there a way that we can help people now? The, the RFP process to the providers is going to take X amount of, I'd like to say months, not years, but let's face it, it's going to stretch out over some time period. And if we've got some people with simple barriers now with cash in hand, I, I still can't get out of my simple mind that there's some things that we could do now. If, you're, if, if equipment is a barrier to somebody right now today, we could help that person today without RFPs and contracts and 18 months of, I, I guess I, I can't get out of my head that well, my people can help now. I think where she's coming from, is the way I hear it, is you need to get to find out if there's somebody who will actually put fiber there. You don't want to buy equipment if you can actually get them fiber. We're waiting to see how they respond before we buy equipment. But like to me, there's a difference between the 900 and the 800. The 800 there seems is. to be a demographic that we might actually have a, a chance to make a difference in. And I may be oversimplifying. I apologize if I am. So it just it, seems like we could do some good quickly. So helping access to the fixed wireless solution will be infinitely quicker than helping access to deploying fiber. However, fiber is the better long-term solution. So what will likely happen is um, the path forward of working on fixed, valley, fixed wireless will kind of happen simultaneously with the fiber because once we have agreement as to how many are gonna sign up for fixed wireless, they can deploy pretty quickly, unlike the fiber, which is permitting and infrastructure and all the rest of that. So I would say that once we've identified those who want to sign up for fixed wireless, we can get them hooked up in a few months. Okay. Fiber, fiber is going to take longer because there's just a longer process. But you also have equity in of, of different uncertain groups to say, well, you just took, you took care of them last year. Well, how come you're not taking care of me? Just open that can of worms. Yes. And you can explain why that's the case, but that's not because that's... Well, except that... Um, 
I, I, I don't quote me on this, but my guess is that the majority or a significantly high number of people who signed up for Hudson Valley Wireless saw subsidies from the Broadband for All program because they were one of the awarded contractors. However, there certainly will be people who were not in the award areas who were not subsidized. And yes, we are yeah, gonna be close. Right. Okay. And that just made me think equity and people to tell them about it. When you pick a Swiss cheese area that's got a pole fiber, and I can think of several roads in my town where it's on one end and then another mile, it's on the other end and just pulling through there is gonna take care of a lot of people. Is your big gonna include the offshoot lanes that have two houses, two miles up the road? Yes, sir. That? Okay, yeah. that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Every single address okay. that is not seasonal okay. should have ended up in this list. Now again, could have missed some. But it's as good a list as you could compile. With the, time with the data time. that I have. Gotcha. Okay. She caught the ones in our town. Now I have a question, and I don't know. Does the state and the county do they set up a way? Are they taxed like phone lines, utility lines? So the minute they run this cable, are they going to have to pay taxes on it? Like New York State implements phone? two different kinds of taxes. On um, there is a real property tax on equipment. And then there was a fiber tax, which was um, imposed. It was a rate per mile of, of for every mile on state right of ways that uh, fiber was run. That was rescinded. Um, so the existing tax, the ones that remains, is the real property tax. And the real property tax is formulated based on the type of company you incorporated as. So therefore, the rate that a Spectrum, a Hudson Valley Wireless, and a Slick, what they pay are going to vary based on the kind of corporations they are. So there is a, some form of tax. Yes. I can envision in some of the rural towns where even if we paid them to run 10 miles of line, and they've got four customers, their return will cover the taxes and maintenance on that. That is correct. In which case, they don't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole. That right? will happen. So if you've got four people at 10 miles, that's going to be the last service. Mm -hmm. And that is why the whole to have a lot more people than right. Well, I understand that, but it's going to be part of the bid. That's why they're the blocks the way they are. So and some of them, them nobody will bid on. And some of them they'll make big money on, and others they'll lose on, and you're hoping they come out a winner in the end. But so if you some it still might be unserved, is all yep. I'm saying when we're done. Well, no matter they pick what the you block, do. they got to do the whole block. Yeah, uh, that's the way it's oh, I understand, right. but there are going to be blocks that are going to be one okay. off. Okay. There might not be any blocks that don't get. They might not get. Paid. It's hard to know. But. Well, in in your example, Dan. So let's say that we end up with. In, in one of those sections that we've divided the county into, and I'm going to call them service areas. In one of those service areas, let's say that there's 100 homes. And let's say that, like, I happen to know the case in Easton where it happens to be the end of a line of equipment, and in order to get service to those two homes, the cost of the equipment is so high that the tax that that provider would have to pay on it would be more than the monthly revenue they would get from the two people who were able to sign up. However, if those two houses are two out of 98 that they're gonna get subsidized for and they're going to be getting revenue hopefully from 98 other houses, it might offset the high operating costs of the two. And that's part of the reason for doing it this way because the more we leave those hard to get households, it's going to just be more costly to get them down the road somewhere. So you're going to have to be creative on your Swiss cheese holes to have some good ones there and some some problem ones so that they have. Well, it's like the healthcare exchange. You got to have really healthy people up in there to make sure that they can get so the unhealthy broadband yeah. company is going to have going to have to be creative. <laughs> That's a great example. Yep. Any other questions for Laura Grace Robin? 
Hey, I recognize she's done a lot of work in my town, so I'm hoping everybody realizes the work she's done. I was impressed. Thank you. Thank you. She'd like to hear that when her uh, review comes. Up. <laughs> um, well, yeah. More a bunch of time. Or when I get, or when I get the phone calls, how come you missed me? We're gonna you try. Are you having a phone Yep. Yeah. So that's just one last quick thing. I just wanted to give you a final roundup on the um, CFA and the funding awards that happened. Um, there were a few awards that were a little bit late. As I, I gave you the numbers last month, but WQIPs had not been announced yet. Um, just FYI, and you may know this through other committee, there was $400,000 that went to DPW for the <coughs> County uh, 37 project. And there was $30,000 that went to um, the sewer district for a Hudson Falls infrastructure plan. Um, also, Restore New York was announced. Um, the village of Hudson Falls got $600,000 for um, 188 Main Street. And the village of Greenwich got $1.6 million, which will take care of what I call the hole in the ground where the fire was. Um, there's going to be a structure rebuilt there. New York Forward was announced, which was two and a quarter million to um, the village of Cambridge, which is going to be taking care of a number of projects that um, there's Varick Park that's going to be worked on. There's Alkill Commons behind the IGA there, et cetera. So in total for the year, um, between state and federal funding, um, about $6.8 million went into our communities this year. That is not counting the 10.8 million that may or may not end up getting used in the village of Cambridge for wastewater. So, um, so some pretty significant funding went in for some good sized projects. We've come a long way. I remember when we first hired more and one of our significant supervisors, we didn't hire existing parents. Well, look where it's really gone and it's not important. To influx that kind of money in our communities. Back in 2000, they agreed that this stuff from Washington County was not. Hmm. No worries. Any other business to put forward? Thank you. You know, the interesting about